This is the month before the Hedja, and it's one of the four sacred months. Um, there are a few things historically that are important in this month for us to just keep recollection of. In this month, we had the Ghazwa of Khanna, the battle where the Sahaba Ikram built a trench around the Prophet city of Minamunawa. We have in this month also the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, where the Prophet entered into a peace agreement with Quraysh. It was also the Bay of Ridwan. In this month, also on the seventh day, Umrah was, was uh, performed by our prophets of the And in this month, Hajj was made incumbent upon the Umrah for us to do this at least once in our life, if we are able. There are many other historical components of this month, another important component of this month, the 29th day of the Al-Qaeda. It was a martyrdom of the Hebrew Sultan, one of the great Aulia Sarini, who was also the ruler of Sarini. So we're going to go through a little bit of advice. This is advice for myself, from, uh, first from Imam al Hassan, and then also from Ibn Atta'ad al Sunni. But he specifically gives advice regarding matters of the heart. Which, according to Imam Haddad, after you have a functional component, a functional understanding of your fit, a functional component of the understanding of your aqidah, a functional understanding of how to practice your deen, there's nothing more important for you to invest your time in than making sure your heart is clean. So he says the obligation of the heart after your faith, after protecting your iman, and after tawbah, making a safa is five. He said, number one, being sincere in your actions for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Having ikhlas. One of the things we do before uh, most of our actions is just to make sure that we're doing them for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To start all of your actions with this in that. One of the most often recited surahs in, uh, of our ummah is Qudhu Allahu Ahad Surah Al-Ikhlas. And this is, this is the leading matter. The second thing he says is entertaining a good opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during situations that vex your understanding. Things that you don't comprehend, things that you simply cannot understand, having a good opinion of Allah even in those difficult circumstances. The third is trusting in His promise. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us certain promises. I remember one day sitting with Imam Zayd and according to one of the promises I said, Insha'Allah, he said, no, Mubin, this is not something where you say, Insha'Allah, this is something that's a promise directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the haq that he has given to us. Fourth, he says, have hope. Fear the punishment of God. And last, he says, and hope for the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we're going to take each one of these. First, he says, faith is mentioned, which is describing as your affirmation of his exclusive rights, subhanahu wa ta'ala, to be worshipped. You don't have anything else, there's no ilallah. There's no except Allah. It's just la ilaha illallah. There's oneness in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your worship, in your commitment to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's no ilaha. And then he says, the second part is repentance. His rububiyah. An affirmation of his lordship. He has power over all of his creation. In Allah la kulli And it is not reduced one iota by any material creation. Anything that he does will not reduce any any qudra that he has. And amongst his the most exclusive power is the ability to forgive. The ability to forgive our sins and obliterate any traces or effects upon our deeds. May Allah forgive all of our sins and forgive all of our faults and make us amongst that little on side. There is actually a beautiful story that is told about a king and his family. Now, if anyone knows about kings, old, they had a deep love of birds. And as we know, the king of the birds, right, in Urdu they call them Shabazz, is like the eagles, the falcons, they fly high in the sky. And they're not the same as the birds that fly low to the ground. They're 
two completely different classes. But the mother, the king, and his falcon, he always would take care of it, allow it to extend his needs, feed it when the falcon is supposed to be fed, so specifically meat, hunting meat. One day, the falcon lost its way, just decided to revolt against the king. And it flew away from its master. And it flew to an old woman who ran a bakery. She immediately found it. This is a beautiful bird. She said, but it's not been kept well. The first thing she did was clip its wings. The second thing that she did, cut its talons. And instead of feeding it meat, according to its diet, she started feeding it straw. And she said to this bird, it's unfortunate that your previous master did not treat you well. Your wings are too long, your talons are too long, and I'm going to look after you. The Kulan king, in his, in his goodness, looked for the falcon. He looked for it in many places in his kingdom. Finally, he came to this woman's tent. And when he saw it, he wept. And he said to the bird, this is your reward, you're going to lose your faith in How could you have flown away from paradise to a situation where you think is, is this, where you're receiving it now as to be held? He said, don't you know the inhabitants of the fire and the paradise are not equal? And the bird's response to the king was simply to bow his head and simply to say, I have sinned, and now I'm repentant. <coughs> and my none is now So he says, if we don't put our faith in our repentance and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we don't put our these things in its rightful place, we literally will be hit. We will be bound, our talons will be bound to the earth. And we won't realize our full potential to fly high in the sky. He says that the next component is to be sincere in your dealings with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said that having ikhlas in your actions, not having ikhlas in your actions can take you far, far, far away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ibn Ta'ala says in relation to this, he said it's not even the mistake that counts, it's the response. If a person makes a, an error, it's to immediately be told about. If a person turns away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his strategic response is to turn back to Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of the most beneficial ways of doing this is salawat upon the Prophet. Habib was just here, and then just earlier this week, he said specifically there will be a person crossing the sirat, and he'll stumble, he'll lose his balance. And then the salawat upon the Prophet from this realm will come and act as a breeze and regain his balance and be able to continue on his path. And he continues, Imam Mahasri, he says that have a good opinion of Allah subhanahu wa the authority of Abu Hurairah and the Allah and the Hadith we see narrated by Imam Bukhari and Sayyid Muslim, he says, I am as my servant thinks me to be. And he continues, he says, expect the best from your Lord. Expect it from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Think of him as generous and gracious, and he will be generous and gracious with you. He said, and if you have this opinion of him being generous and gracious, you will watch his grace and his generosity manifest in every aspect of your life. But you have to have this opinion of him. Imam Shafani continues, and he says, this specific hadith, is an encouragement from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to his, to, his, uh, to his servant. He will treat them based upon your opinion of him. There's some people that have a bad opinion of God. He'll never forgive me. He'll never do this. He'll never do that. This is not the way of the people of, of greatness. They have a tremendous, tremendous expectation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Their hope is high. When they're making dua for Jannah, it's not just for the lowest level. They're asking for Jannah for those. They're asking to be reunited with the Messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They're asking to be amongst the Sahaba Ikram in the afterlife. The people of greatness in this dunya, they don't aspire just to be street cleaners. <laughs> they aspire for greatness even in the dunya. So, what's our, what's our aspiration for Akhirah? 
He says, so the one who has an excellent opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will find tremendous abundance of blessings from God. The ni'mah will come, just expect it. And he said, he will send down upon him beauty and grace and shower him with amazing manifestations and generosity. And he will give to you unprecedented gifts. And then he continues. He says, and then put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How do you do this? He says, increase your dependency on him. Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal, he said, I rejoice in the day that I come to my home and open up my cupboards and find them bare. <coughs> because ultimately, what is your dependency? Hasbunallah. Turning to Allah in this circumstance. He says, and Allah will clothe you, Allah will feed you. Allah will nourish you. Allah will provide for you from sources known and unknown. But, you have to trust Him. It's difficult. We sit down in a barber shop. People take scissors and put them close to your skin. If the barber slips even a little bit, you have a problem. But no one has a problem sitting down literally inside of a, inside of a shop with a human being with a razor sharp tool next to his or her head. What about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? We have no problem of sitting down in an airplane that has a success rate in the 99th percentile, but still, it can crash. And what do we do in an airplane? We fall, we fall asleep. We literally fall asleep. I travel a lot. So some of the best airplanes that you get. You sleep with your mouth open, so you're so relaxed. <laughs> because what? The pilot's in control. Or you're trusting a machine on autopilot. What about trusting Allah? As a child, when you're falling off a swing, you call for your mother. It's not shit to do that. But what about trusting in Allah when we have difficulties? When we're falling off a swing in life, to call in Allah, to increase our dependency on Allah. Trusting in Allah. Very interesting. There's a person by the name of Michael Phillips. He is the founder of a company called Mastercard. Some of you guys don't know. He wrote a book it's called The Seven Laws of Money. The very first rule he has in his seven laws is don't have fear of money. He says, do what you have to do with good intention and money will come. This is a person of the domain who operates in the banking, giving us this advice. What about our trust in Allah? And next, Imam Muhasibi says, and fear is punishment. And lastly, he says, and have hope for His grace. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has hidden three things in three things. He's hidden His punishment in evil deeds, He's hidden His reward in good deeds, and He's hidden His awliya of creation. So Imam Muhasibi says, specifically regarding hope, Hope, right? Hope and fear are the two wings. They come together. You can't have one exclusively without the other. If you don't have them together, there's an imbalance. He says the two wings by which becomes in, uh, the ability for the soul to fly. He talks about the falcon. This is your, these are your wings. He says, and it will take you to every station, every daraja that you need to reach. And it becomes the two mounts that you ascend before you get upon your horse to travel to God. And this horse will take you into the after, into the next world. There's fear and there's hope. When you go in home, in the presence of your parents, there's a reverence that you have. You also have hope that if you mess up, your mother or your father might overlook your faults. They will literally, they, hopefully, if you burn the carpet, they will, not, they will not make your life really difficult. If you break something in the home, the mother and the father will overlook. But at the same time, there's reverence. There's respect. And this is how we have to be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, Allah's punishment is real. 
right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is the commentary. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us that He has preserved Fir'aun's body. If you ever go to Egypt, if you ever go to Egypt and you go to the, the, internet, the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, it was endowed and started by the Ottoman Empire in the 1700s, preserving everything from over, over from the time of Sayyidina Musa, from over 5,000 years ago. The bodies of the pharaohs are preserved, so people can come and witness them, and be reminded of people of old. They are for ayah and ayatullah. The pharaoh mentioned in the Quran is real. Pharaoh's body is preserved. All the pharaoh that came before. Abraha and his temple, if you literally go to the Sakra Gallery in Washington, D.C., they have on display a big members, cubits, blocks from his palace. These things are all real. This is not all storytelling. Allah speaking about this in the Quran, it's real. It will come to life. If you're thinking about the Qawm al go to the Dead Sea. You can literally, if a person has a chance to go to Jordan, they will go and they will see this is a place where there was punishment. This is all real. His signs are here. And we're told to look back at his chain and This is all addressing to us having the ability to see. We also have examples of hope where the Prophet told us to ask for great things, to be with the ones that we love. And if we make our Prophet the great ones that came before us, the ones that we love, inshallah will be reunited. And he says that the last is hope, which is the Jack. And this will give contentment and relief to the heart. Webster's Dictionary defines uh, hope as grace. He says it is, this is literally the definition of the dictionary. He says it's unmerited divine assistance given to human beings for their regeneration. Unmerited. You don't even deserve it. <laughs> Unmerited divine assistance given to human beings for their regeneration. So this is grace. This is our job. When you're broken and you have nowhere else to turn except for your, your hopes and your aspirations and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will see their hopes. Alhamdulillah wa ta'ala wa sallam wa Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashhadu an la ilaha Ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah Ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah Hayya ala
الحمد لله الذي أنزل على أبيه الكتاب ولم يكلفه في وجاء ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن سيدنا محمد نبي ورسول خير ورحمة فيها فنادم كيف تعلمون فتقول الله حق القاضي ولا تنسون إلا وأنتم مسلمون سبحان ربي رب العزة يوم يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان سيدنا محمد عبده ورسوله قال 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 الله سبحانه الله سبحانه وتعالى في القران الكريم بعد اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ان الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا ايها الذين امنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد رب الدرسي كان النبي وعلى اله وصحبه وازواجه اجمعين خصوصا على اقدار الناس بعد النبي الكريم حبيبك الصديق عمر الفاروق عثمان بن نوري وعلي بن مرتضى وحسن وحسين وعلى سيدنا النبي سعيد بن ابي زهره وعلى امه المكرمه حمزه وعباس وعلى كل من في الله بالصحبه النبي بالايمان Allah'a emanet olun.